Well, good evening from London and a warm welcome to you all wherever you are in the world. I'm Brian Burridge. I'm the Chief Executive of the Royal Aeronautical Society. Uh, this event um, is scheduled to last until six o'clock UK time, a lecture by Sir Stephen Hillier, followed by a question and answer session. This is the Society's Brabazon named lecture. It's held in honour of Lord Brabazon of Tara. He was born in London on the 8th of February 1884 and has title to two of the transformational resets in British aviation. He was the first resident English person to fly a heavier than air machine in England in 1909. And if we were doing this live in our headquarters in Hamilton Place, I'd invite you to see the photograph of that event with the luminaries of the time, including the Wright brothers, Charles Rolls and others. Secondly, he played a leading role in creating the nation's civil aviation sector after World War II. Now, doubtless he'd sympathize with the challenges facing civil aviation today the recovery from COVID-19, the climate change challenge, continuing pressure on airspace and withdrawal from EASA at a time when there are a host of novel technologies coming on the scene. So it gives me great pleasure to introduce Sir Stephen Hillier, a fellow of the society who became chair of the Civil Aviation Authority on the 1st of August, 2020. He previously had a long career in the Royal Air Force, eventually becoming the chief of the air staff. And as you'd expect, he has an extensive military flying experience as a pilot and as an instructor on a wide range of aircraft types. Although his flying career did start at the age of 17 when his um, current employer, the CAA, issued him with his private pilot's license. Now, just 100 days plus a few into his new role, what better title for his lecture than the Civil Aviation Authority, What Next? Over to you, Stephen. Well, good evening, everyone. And uh, President Brian, thank you very much indeed for those kind words of welcome and introduction. It's a pleasure to be speaking again to the Royal Aeronautical Society. I find it hard to believe that nearly two years have passed since I last spoke at Hamilton Place. I'd have found it even harder to believe then that when I next addressed the Society, it would be as chair of the Civil Aviation Authority. Also that I'd be doing so while sitting at home, as you can see. And that most significant of all, it would be from the midst of the biggest crisis ever to strike the global aerospace enterprise. More about the crisis later. But thank you, Society, for inviting me to deliver the annual Brabison Lecture this evening. Just to re recap some of what uh, Brian has already mentioned. I mean, Lord Brabazon of Tara, John Moore Brabazon, a towering figure in the early history of aviation in the United Kingdom. The first person, as you've heard, to pilot a heavy linear machine in the United Kingdom. The holder of Royal Aero Club, a pilot license number one, granted over 110 years ago. A pilot in the Royal Flying Corps from 1914 to 1918, earning the Military Cross for his gallantry and one of the founding members of the Royal Air Force on April the 1st, 1918. A Minister of Transport and then the Minister of Aircraft Production during a critical period of the Second World War. And then the post-war chair of the Air Registration Board, the predecessor to the Civil Aviation Authority, and someone therefore who is an important part of the heritage of the organisation that I now have the privilege of helping lead. But since my private pilot's license and number stretches to eight digits and letters rather than just one, I don't intend to pull on those threads of personal historical continuity too much. So I took over as chair of the CAA on the 1st of August, and I would like to thank publicly my predecessor, Dame Deirdre Hutton, for her 11 years of great leadership at the CAA and for the strong legacy which I've been able to inherit. As you heard, with just over 100 days elapsed since I became chair, this lecture has been a perfectly timed opportunity for me to reflect on the principles, values, and personal priorities that are shaping my approach. That's the first section of my talk. Then in the second section, I'll consider what next for the CAA. In other words, defining the CAA we need 
for the future. It should all take me about 35 minutes, after which I very much look forward to the discussion. First then, my personal motivations. You've already seen my biography and Brian has already run through, uh, through it to some degree, but something very important to me is indeed that context of the Civil Aviation Authority and that private pilot's license, which was issued to me by the CAA when I was 17. Receiving that PPL from the CAA was one of the most memorable and decisive moments in my life. It was the foundation of my flying career. So when someone pointed out to me about 14 months ago that a competition had started for the next chair of the CAA, I just liked the idea that I might now be able to give something back to an organization which had had such a big impact on me, as well as the chance, obviously, to remain at the heart of aerospace. Now, I'm frequently asked at the moment, but if only you'd known about COVID and its impact on aerospace, would you still have been so keen and interested? To which my answer is simple, yes, and perhaps even more so. Because I believe passionately in aerospace and its future. I believe that the CAA has a vital role in enabling aerospace success. I, like everyone in the CAA, believe in service, the public good. And if I can contribute in some way to leading aerospace and the CAA through the greatest challenges ever faced, but frankly, I'm in. There are three headline principles that shape my CAA thinking. Independence, leadership and inclusivity. Independence. The ability for us to analyse and make decisions impartially is the essence of our being. The foundation of our ability to retain the respect, trust and confidence of those that we regulate and of all of our stakeholders. We will always closely guard that independence. But independence, independence does not mean isolation or remoteness. We must be, we are, constantly engaged, listening, learning, explaining. Humble enough to admit that we're not always right, always willing to adapt and change. Leadership. I strongly believe that the CAA has a vital leadership role in aerospace. Now, I don't mean leadership in the sense that we somehow try to set the vision and run the enterprise. That would not be possible, sensible, or indeed within our remit. But I do mean leadership in the sense that we must be an exemplar of values and that we lead the just culture by exemplifying the principles ourselves. Leadership in the essential role that we play in creating the conditions and environment to enable others' successes. Leadership which leverages our convening powers to improve coherence and coalesce thinking around key issues. Leadership which is about doing the right thing, not simply trying to find an answer which makes everyone happy or brokering the only one that everyone can agree upon. And finally, leadership which does not rest heavily on our status as an authority. Yes, we have that if we need it, but we deploy it sparingly. All of my experience in aerospace and more widely is that success is best achieved not by constantly and heavy handedly telling people what to do or by ever more regulation, but by creating the environment where people are themselves motivated to do the right thing. Inclusivity, and I mean in the broadest sense of the word, we must be a CAA for all, equally for every part and person of the aerospace enterprise and for all the consumers that we serve. Easy to say, but how do we balance our efforts, prioritize, ensure that our decisions are not biased or perceived to be biased towards one set of stakeholders over another? Typically at the moment, that might be a view that our decisions favor the interests of commercial flying over recreational flying, or of airlines over consumers. And I very much sense that this is a, deb a debate likely to intensify with the requirements and priorities of new and growing sectors, most obviously remotely piloted air systems. There is no ready-made template here, no magic formula which will solve the problem to everyone's satisfaction. 
but I am clear that the CAA has only one inherent bias, and that is towards the interests of consumers and the public, and that our focus is risk, likelihood and consequence. What is proportional? What is the law? What is within the powers given to us? In this and across the board, inclusion means that we must engage and communicate as widely and as well as we can across the enormous breadth of our activities. We engage not because we have to, but because we want to. It means that we consider all perspectives equally, make decisions which are transparent, reasonable, based on evidence to the greatest extent possible, and that we explain when judgments have had to be made. Our decisions cannot be done simply by majority voting, and I'm acutely aware that our decisions won't make everyone happy. But then I worked in the centre of the Ministry of Defence for well over a decade in total, so I have useful experience in that respect. And inclusion means diversity and access. As an enterprise, we must be better at reflecting our society and our consumers, with everyone equally valued, respected and given opportunity. Which is at the heart of the CAA values, recently agreed by the board, and which we're now rolling out. I mentioned them not only because they describe what we expect from each other within the CAA, and the important part they play in building our one CAA mindset, but because they also summarise what stakeholders and consumers can expect when they deal with us. We will have respect for everyone. We will do the right thing. We will build collaborative relationships and we will never stop learning. Success is not just about what we do, but how we do it. Needless to say, we believe that respect for all applies equally to our expectations of how people will deal with our people in turn. I understand that regulators may not always be popular, but I'm very clear that disagreements do not justify unacceptable behavior towards our staff who are doing their very best to perform a vital public service role. Let me now turn to my personal priorities. Number one, continue to be, a, uh, be respected as a world-class regulator, with the safety and interests of consumers at our core, enjoying the trust and confidence of all of our stakeholders. Two, ensure we have the capability, agility and flexibility to respond and where appropriate lead the many challenges and rapid change that we are experiencing in aerospace. Three, ensure that we continue to have excellent people with the capabilities, expertise and experience to meet our current and future tasks, supported by the right leadership, organization and culture. In delivering against these personal priorities, I hope that I bring useful knowledge and experience to my new role, but I know that I also need to take every opportunity to develop that knowledge and understanding of how the CAA works, how the sector works, and of areas previously relatively unfamiliar to me, such as economic regulation and consumer rights. And I'm very grateful to all those who are giving so generously of their time to help me in that process. The three priorities I've outlined are not in order. They all have to be met for us to succeed, but none of them will happen without us getting the people priority right. The expertise and experience of our people is the only important asset which the CAA owns. Without that intellectual capital, we are nothing. I've already been immensely impressed with our people's capabilities, commitments and dedication in the day job and through the extraordinary flexibility and agility which they have shown in responding successfully and rapidly to crises, not least COVID. Speaking personally, and I know on behalf of my CAA board colleagues, I just want to take the opportunity in this important forum to thank every single person in the CAA for their excellent work and to register my complete confidence that they will continue rising to the many challenges ahead. To round off this first section of my talk, I want to complete the picture by setting out three closely connected general principles which guide my personal approach to being a regulator. First, I believe that the primary responsibility for delivering aviation safety does not rest with the CAA. 
Clearly, the CAA has its vital statutory role accountable to Parliament for setting the framework, for being a national repository of knowledge and expertise, for sharing lessons and encouraging best practice, for working with other regulatory bodies nationally and internationally, and for providing assurance that the highest safety standards are indeed being met. But the primary responsibility for safety must lie with those conducting the activity. We enable, others deliver. Second and closely related is that I firmly believe in delegation. If those conducting the activity are primarily responsible for safety, then it will only feel that way in practice if responsibilities are delegated as much as practicable to those organisations and people who are closest to the activity. That does not mean come, uh, delegation come what may. Delegation has to be responsibly carried out, has to be earned on the basis of evidence, indeed has to be wanted, and it still has to be independently supervised and assured proportionally. Third, while the CEA is the authority, it's in the name, as I touched on when I spoke about leadership earlier, I'm clear that authority needs to, de needs to be deployed sparingly and does not set the tone of how we routinely conduct ourselves or our business. Regulation is necessary. In most cases, it's founded on a collective store of knowledge and hard-won experience across decades of aviation activity. But that doesn't mean that more regulation will always equal more safety. We should only regulate where necessary and appropriate. So our approach will therefore continue to focus strongly on performance-based regulation and oversight. Our role will be proportionate to the activity and the risk involved. And it will recognise that we can only be truly effective if we have the trust, confidence and support of those that we regulate. In that respect, the statement I've heard perhaps most often from those that we regulate over the last few months is, we need to know, we need to look at how much regulation we have, with a particular slant at the moment of COVID recovery. To which my response is consistent. I agree. But please tell me which particular part of regulation you have in mind. Now, I'm not saying that we only react to requests. We are deep into red tape challenges for a whole range of reasons. But we also need you to help us identify areas where you think there could and should be more flexibility. And I point to our track record of flexibility and responsiveness during COVID as an example. We've been exceptionally busy throughout, dealing with exemptions, alleviations, extensions, rapid airspace change requests, many other things besides. With that, let me now turn to the second section of my talk and start defining the CAA of the future. That has to start with a conversation about COVID the greatest disruption to aerospace in its history. I don't need to rehearse with this audience, especially the details of the current crisis that we face across almost the entire enterprise. From commercial passenger carrying to general aviation, from the aerospace industry to airports, from the highly skilled and experienced people we are losing to the impact across communities and the economy, regionally and nationally. The impact now is profound, and there are equally profound consequences that we will be dealing with for many years to come once the immediate effects of the pandemic pass. As we look to that recovery, we need to ask ourselves, who and what remains? How solid are the foundations which we seek to rebuild upon? And in what form and ways do we wish to rebuild? There are innumerable aspects to these challenges. So if I don't mention them all, then that simply reflects the time available, not because those other areas are insignificant. First, there's the impact on consumers, for without having their trust and confidence, then we're not building back at all, never mind better. Consumers expect that pandemic or not makes no difference to our successful management of safety, security, and public health risks, and they're right. We have to be alert to and mitigate the potential safety risks which are inherent in our current situation. There has been drastic sh shrinkage with the loss of many skilled and experienced individuals. For those that remain, their recency is a key concern, as is their sense of well-being 
and the effect that that might have on the professional capabilities. I'm not saying, therefore, that safety will be compromised, but I am saying that full awareness of the potential risks during recovery is the critical first step to the successful mitigation process. I've been reassured by the priority which accountable managers supported by their boards have placed on safety throughout the current crisis. And I also call out again my team in the CAA for the vital and exceptional work that they've been doing in this area during the crisis. The challenge is not over though, and I think it's fair to say that the risks during recovery will be greater than those during the rapid downsizing. We need to be ahead of this potential trend and calibrate carefully the pace of recovery when industry accelerates to satisfy the pent-up demand for air travel. We also need to reassure consumers in relation to public health considerations, not primarily a CAA responsibility, but by whatever means, we need to have a reliable and internationally recognized means of enabling freer movement of passengers. And we need to reassure consumers in relation to their consumer rights. We have proved beyond doubt that the consumer protections which were in place at the start of the pandemic, particularly relating to refunds, were neither designed nor adequate to deal with the current situation. It has been a long and painful journey for far too many. Difficult though that has been in itself, what consumers will rightly tolerate even less is future repetition. The lesson has been plainly, uh, plainly shown. We need to ensure it's learned. From a CAA perspective, I can assure you that we have expended an enormous amount of effort within the powers that we have in helping ensure that consumers get the refunds to which they are fully entitled. I know it won't feel this way to many. I believe we've been the most active regulator in Europe respect. Even so, our current powers, and particularly their ability to deliver timely resolution, have not been adequate. Giving us greater powers to act is essential for consumers, and also it's very important for the CAA. I'm concerned that our effectiveness in relation to securing timely refunds could be seen as an indicator of our effectiveness across the breadth of our responsibilities. That's a problem for anybody which has retaining the trust and confidence of consumers at its core. Let me turn now to the rest of what next for the CAA. I should emphasize from the start that the most important consideration of what next is ensuring that we keep an absolute focus on providing the leadership necessary to keep the show on the road day to day. We will always prioritize our everyday duties in safety, security, and consumer protection. And the capacity we're using to define our future is not diminishing our ability to respond to COVID. We know our priorities. We know that for airlines, airports, industry across the sector, it's in many cases a close-in struggle for survival. We are incredibly active in providing whatever support we can. And we are cons constantly considering whether there's more that we can do, including working with government on the aviation recovery plan. But we know that there are many other long-term aerospace issues that we must get to grips with. So we also need to lift our eyes and look towards the horizon to understand what those future challenges will be, to understand the CAA's role in dealing with them, to ensure that the CAA has the capabilities and the resources to discharge its future responsibilities. Appropriately enough, our work is called Project Horizon. What then are the key considerations feeding into the horizon work? These are to say preparations for the post-COVID world, the threats and the opportunities, and the vital role which the CAA must play. One of the many notable aspects of that will be ensuring that we don't just think about the lessons learned for this current and possible future pandemics. We need also to capture what the crisis has taught us about our resilience in the round, we need to have more robust defences in place. Then there's the CAA's role in properly getting to grips with the greatest long-term threat to the resilience and viability of aerospace, decarbonisation and achieving net zero. I welcome the way in which government has been setting out its ambitions in this respect. It would be clearly be unrealistic and inappropriate for the CAA to be at the centre of every one of the innumerable aspects of the challenge. But I do say the CEA needs to take a greater, sometimes leading, role 
those areas where it is appropriate, qualified, and empowered to do so. Airspace modernization, a key component of reducing greenhouse emissions and in tackling other environmental impacts such as noise. But it is much else besides. In line with the thinking behind the Airspace Change Organizing Group, it's vital that we think of airspace as a part of our critical national infrastructure. That our future national airspace laydown is the result of whole design, not just an aggregated series of local measures. One that importantly safely frees up as much airspace as possible for as many users as possible. And that we have the airspace which helps create the environment which best allows for the rapid expansion of remotely piloted air systems. In relation to those systems in particular, it's obvious that as we build back from COVID, the balance of demand for airspace usage is going to be ever more driven by their requirements and the opportunities which they offer. In all of this, I should emphasize that the CAA does not see greater control or to constrain or complicate airspace access, especially for recreational general aviation. I know that safety and utility is enhanced by having the greatest volume of airspace available and that it can be enabled further by ever greater employment of technology-based deconfliction, principally electronic conspicuity. For I'm delighted that our recently launched rebate scheme for EC devices has already had considerable uptake with immediate safety benefits, which I hope will quickly grow incrementally. Then, of course, there's withdrawal from the EU and EASA. The CAA has been doing significant preparatory work since 2016 to prepare for the whole range of possible outcomes, including no agreement. I'm going to say that as a consequence, the situation is risk free, but I can reassure you that we are extremely active in doing all that we can to mitigate those risks. We have recruited the additional people we need. We already have a strong body of expertise, and we progress to stress testing our new structures to ensure that we're as ready as we can be. But despite all the good preparation, you know as well as I do that risk and uncertainty inevitably remains. With that in mind, we have our contingency planning teams identified and on readiness to ensure that we can respond quickly to any last minute challenges which arise in the last few weeks prior to the changeover point, i.e. over the Christmas and New Year period. We all know that the transition point is far from the end of the story. More risks and issues will inevitably arise, which we will need to deal with. But we must also look towards the opportunities. We might be out of EASA, but we remain one of the world's leading aerospace nations, with the industry, international relationships, and reputation to match. We recognized early on that in order to maximize stability for the aerospace sector, we would need to form new working agreements with regulators and the markets that our industry works with most closely. And that's exactly what we've been doing. We'll keep doing it. We might be leaving the EU and EASA, but nothing in that implies isolationism. We do not want to distance ourselves from Europe or anywhere else. That implies an ever greater need for us to reinforce our current international relationships and to build new ones. That work is well in hand. Whether you are a design, production, or maintenance organization, the agreements we have reached so far will hopefully, hopefully give you reassurance and stability you need to continue operating smoothly in the markets that are most important to you. But as an, organ as an organization committed to engagement, learning, and adapting, the CEA, we continually actively to seek out contributions, advice, and insight to help us ensure that we can discharge our remit and assist you to the very best of our ability. While mitigating the risks, as I say, we should also look to exploiting the potential greater freedoms we have in our decision making. An example of how we're taking this forward is our general aviation challenge framework, which has just gone out to consultation and which we plan to start actioning early in 2021. We're aiming to enable the sector to thrive in a post EU transition context by exploring opportunities where we can consistent with safety and our international obligations. By simplifying and rationalizing regulation, removing red tape and gold plating, streamlining and speeding up processes. By being more proportionate, 
delegating where practical and wanted, encouraging innovation. Equally, we don't want to backtrack on any recent changes and create unnecessary further disturbance or diverge internationally where it would be unproductive to do so. And we want to protect UK industry from any unintended consequences or risks. This won't all happen overnight, so expectations need to be managed. And whilst the themes I've described that we're currently working on are in relation to general aviation, they're also a very good representation of our wider approach. Within the responsibilities and resources we have, we want to play our full part, in not only maintaining, but growing the UK status as a leading aerospace nation and the place to do business. Through Horizon, we're also working through how the CAA can be more effective in protecting consumer interests. We have a good track record in many respects, exemplified not just by the CAA's outstanding response in the last couple of years to the collapse of Monarch and Thomas Cook Airlines, but also by our world-leading performance in improving accessibility to air travel for all those who wish to fly. But I know that we tend to get judged by what doesn't go so well. And I know that consumer expectations are constantly rising. I welcome those rising expectations. I want us constantly to be striving to do better. I want us to be held to account by those that we serve. And I want us constantly to be judged as world leading. On innovation and new technologies, the CAA already has a significant role here, ensuring that regulation both keeps pace and enables the exploitation of new technologies. More about this would be a lecture in itself, but self-evidently this has to be a key area of growth for our business and in creating the best environment in the UK for rapid development and fielding of new air systems, as I say, especially the piloted ones. We're also taking a growing role in promoting skills, the STEM agenda, diversity across aerospace, and we're preparing to take on UK space regulation subject to parliamentary approval helping to enable quickly the most favorable environment to grow the potential for greater commercial exploitation of space from the UK. These areas and more besides are what we have captured within Project Horizon, which will bring it all together into a coherent strategy. But defining the, CA, but defining the CAA of the future is not just about saying what we do, but also how we do it. Key therefore to Project Horizon's success are work streams on people and culture and greater digitization. Importantly, Horizon will also plainly acknowledge the essential duality of the CEA's role. How we safeguard the integrity of our independent regulatory role on the one hand, whilst on the other being a key enabler to the success of the aerospace enterprise that we regulate. I don't see an inherent conflict here. It's important that the roles are not separate, but they are separable within our organization. And most of the organizations indeed in some way have this sort of duality and successfully compartmentalize. Let me now conclude. I'm not going to attempt a summary, not least as I know that there will be a number of other areas that you'll wish to cover in questions. I simply haven't been able to address the breadth of the CAA's remit or every possible issue in the time available. But if nothing else, what I hope to have done is given you an insight into the motivations and priorities which are shaping how I'm personally approaching my new role as chair of the CAA and what we in the CAA have in mind as we seek to set our organization for the future. The chair role is one that I feel immensely privileged to have been given the opportunity to fill. If I can in my time with the CAA advance further in some small way, the powerful legacy left to UK aviation by Lord Brabazon, then there will be no one prouder than me. Thank you very much indeed. Well, thank you very much for that wide ranging tour of your intray. Um, quite daunting, uh, to say the least, and perhaps a great, great contrast uh, in some areas with the sort of thing uh, Lord Brabazon had to deal with. But there's, um, as you might expect, there's a good uh, number of questions. I'll try and um, 
perhaps uh, chop them into themes. And, and I think the first theme is uh, one you touched on, but worth pursuing a little more. And that, that matter of duality, relationship with, um, with government, with your department, your owning department, and relationship with industry. So um, could you just um, uh, give us your early impressions of what your relationship is like with the DFT and the extent to which, um, and you mentioned yourself, the increasing expectation of consumer rights, you know, the, the, that borders on politics. So how does that all look to you at this stage? Well, I mean, it's one of the key issues that we have to deal with, but then, you know, most um, organizations do, and certainly arms, arms length bodies like the CAA has to uh, has to deal with. The, the way I see it is that um, there are, you know, three legs of the stool. Um, there is, you know, industry, consumers, you know, those that we serve. Uh, there is uh, government um, and there is the CAA. And what we want to uh, do is, um, not be in one camp or the the other. We want to uh, play our successful part in enabling the enterprise as a whole. So I would hope that we are um, trusted and respected um, by all parts of the organisation. Now that's not to mean it, that doesn't mean to say that uh, you know we'll somehow be um, uh, liked or that everybody will um, think that our every decision we make is. Um, it's absolutely the right one. Of course, it's not like that. And as I touched on in the, uh, the talk, is that um, uh, what we are trying to do is make sure we understand uh, all of the perspectives out there, we engage with all of the stakeholders, uh, that we gather as much evidence as we possibly can, and that we make our decision. Uh, and that decision, you know, those decisions are very, very rarely a um, result of a formula. Um, they, you know, we will apply evidence wherever we can, but sometimes, fact, quite often, judgments have to be made. When we make those judgments, um, we will explain what was in our mind. Why did we make this judgment? How did we evaluate this evidence and come up with this uh, conclusion? Um, people will challenge us on that, and that is absolutely the, the, the right that the, yeah, they have to, have to do. But it is through the processes that we go through that I think that we um, hold on to the, the trust and confidence that people have. Have. Um, so, you know, as a, as a long way of saying is that um, uh, we don't want to be in anybody's camp apart from our own, but we want to be able to engage with all of the, the camps which are which are out there. Thank you. And um, one perhaps specific area which uh, is bound to come to prominent prominence in the coming weeks, in fact, and. That's the extent to which the lessons from the 737 MAX recertification process and the failings originally, and the extent to which that will have implications in the future for the relationship between a regulator and the relationship with industry. Uh, yes, I mean, uh, you know, very much a, uh, a key topical uh, issue at the moment. And needless to say, we, like every other uh, regulator uh, around the world, have very closely um, at all of the underlying causes which led to those uh, those tragic accidents and all which has uh, gone subsequently. Um, every nation has its particular way of doing uh, doing business. Uh, you know, I, I'm not going to be uh, so bold to, to say that you know, that, um, that there's a perfect solution out there, um, but it has been a a very clear reminder of uh, the risks of not getting that balance in the relationship um, between uh, the CAA, our statutory uh, role as an independent uh, regulator, uh, and those that, that we regulate. So it is absolutely a key issue. We've been studying the 737 MAX um, uh, issues very, very carefully um, and, uh, and learning, the, yeah, learning the lessons. And uh, you won't be surprised, there's quite a lot of interest in um... Uh, life after Brexit, and particularly um, the working relationships with the ARSA. And we've got a question from Vienna here, uh, but um, not so much uh, the high-level politics, but how do you anticipate the day-to-day -day interaction with the ARSA continuing? 
Well, I mean, you know, clearly there are uh, challenges at the moment as a, not in relation to the day-to-day -day, uh, relationships between CAA and DIASA, um, but uh, you know, that only exists within the context of the, uh, the higher level agreements which are being negotiated. So um, you know, we've been very clear about uh, contributing to those negotiations or the evidence in support of those nego negotiations. Um, uh, we will need to see what the deal is before we um, have the fine detail. But, um, you know, so the inevitably, I think there are likely to be potential frictions along the way. But I would put those frictions in the context of we have a common agenda here across the aerospace en enterprise, and I think it transcends political considerations. Um, it is about safety and ensuring that um, we, uh, we don't compromise that in any way. So, you know, we, we start from that baseline uh, in our uh, relationship, which I think is very um, good and proper. Um, what I want to make sure that we do is, you know, as we finally transition out of the EU, as we move out of EASA into being a, a, a sovereign uh, regulator, um, that we don't become isolationist. Is if there have been um, points of friction, um, we will need to uh, to repair those points of friction with EASA. Uh, we want to have the productive relationship as we possibly can with EASA. We want to do the same with the FAA. We want to do the same with other regulators uh, around the world, and putting a lot of effort. Uh, into that, um, because as I say, they, they, you know, um, withdrawal from the EU does not mean isolation, um, neither from the UK overall, but certainly for the, uh, the CAA. A lot of work into that, and it will require a lot of work uh, beyond the 1st of January next year. Uh, thank you. And the, there's a question here um, from uh, someone who is working on. Um, the KC-46 program in the US, where it's just been announced that that will have dual certification between the military authorities and the FAA. And um, uh, it, from your background, you'll well remember the Royal Air Force taking on the A330 and dual certifying that. So what problems does that, um, uh, the nature of dual certification have for the CAA? And what sort of relationship do you imagine you'll be able to forge with the military aviation authority? Uh, so, I mean, I obviously don't know the detail of um, uh, KC-46 and the arrangements in place. Uh, so I'm, I'm more talking at the sort of general uh, principle level. Here. I mean, first say in relation to um, the relationships with uh, the MAA, uh, they, they are good. Um, uh, you know, in so many areas we share um, common concerns, common uh, common issues. Uh, so, you know, I'm very confident we have the right relationship there. And in some aspects of um, safety, for example, the Airprox Board, we, we co-fund, co-sponsor uh, the work which goes on there. So, a very close relationship uh, uh, aspect. Um, and you know, and despite what the perceptions I think which some have is that the there are far more contacts um, between military aviation and civil aviation in terms of mitigation of risk than uh, there are uh, differences, if you like. It's, it's not an unfair landscape. In terms of um, uh, dual certification, uh, then, well, we can already see that work with the MAA and a number of uh, platforms between some CAA to, to, to MAA, uh, and I know that work continues. And that that's just, you know, it's not only Good for safety, but it's good just in terms of uh, basic uh, efficiency. In terms of the dual certification um, uh, between uh, ourselves and others, then uh, it's not something that I, you know, I, I would want to look at the particular uh, case that we're talking about and what the issues are. I don't want to give a, a, a generous, generalist answer to that because uh, it's a pretty, um, sensitive area and one that we need to get right for the obvious reason. Uh, thank you. Um, uh, there's um... A wide variety of slightly tactical questions, but um, one is, um, if I can generalize, um, the complexity of um, pilot licensing, type certification, et cetera, um, as we move out of the COVID era is generally seen, uh, or not generally, but is seen by some as over complex. Um, 
Are you uh, are you aware of a consultation coming up on that, or uh, any attempt to um, simplify and rationalise that area? Uh, short answer is uh, is yes. Um, you know, I think what um, COVID uh, has demonstrated, amongst um, uh, so many other things, is that um, uh, we have not necessarily taken all of the advantages that we could have or should have in relation to digitization and doing um, things in a third decade of the 21st century uh, way. Uh, so COVID has, has clearly shone a light on that and uh, we are uh, responding to that. Now, it's not a matter of, well, we'll just change overnight um, because like everybody else at the moment, uh, we have the challenges of, well, how do you execute? Uh, what would be a significant change to our way of doing business when uh, virtually everybody is working remotely. Um, they, that is a particular challenge. But um, I, I think that we are very, well, I know that we're very clear that in a number of areas we need to uh, modernise our approach, um, which not only will make it like a, a better user interface uh, with us, um, but it will also provide a more robust system. So there'll be many advantages come off the, uh, come off the back of it. So, um, uh, you know, we will engage, uh, we are engaging uh, with as many stakeholders as we can to find out what are these things um, uh, if we don't know them already. Um, but I, I, say, I just need to do a little bit of expectation management. I can't just flip the switch overnight um, because there are significant issues involved, there are resource issues involved, and uh, we are um, not best configured uh, to make significant changes. Uh, but the work is very much in hand. Yeah, I, I mean, in many cases, you're not alone in that dilemma in um, having to advance the digitization process uh, as rapidly as possible. Um, if evidence were needed of the breadth of your portfolio, here's something uh, slightly different. How are you planning to support the historic jets industry at this crucial time when it's shrinking so quickly? and when it's needed to inspire the new generation and remind of the leading role that the country has played in developing jet aircraft and advancing aviation technologies? So I, you know, I think it's probably um, uh, unnecessary for me to say that I get the uh, importance of historic jets and what they, uh, what they bring uh, and the way in which they uh, can attract people. Uh, to aerospace as a career. I mean, it's one of the most common things that I would hear, uh, particularly in my uh, previous appointments, when I'd say, well, what attracted you to the aerospace? And say, well, I went to an air show, uh, seeing by my parents to an air show, uh, and historic um, uh, military aircraft are an important part of that. But what I would say is that uh, you, you used a, a significant word uh, there, Brian, and it was support. Uh, the CAA does not support directly uh, any sector. Um, uh, it would be wrong if we did. And if we start getting into support, then that encompasses a whole range of uh, activities and potentially gets us into the difficult territory um, that we, um, we're speaking about earlier on. So it is not our job to sponsor any particular uh, part of the sector. Our job is to enable uh, and to ensure that the uh, the regulatory environment is uh, proportional and uh, to the activity which is being uh, carry, carried out uh, in the best way that we can. Uh, clearly, we've got some painful um, uh, reminders of the challenges uh, there, and I don't want to comment about particular cases, but we need to respect that uh, as the general environment in which we're operating at the, at the moment. So, um, uh, as I say, uh, we will do our, uh, our duties in relation to historic aircraft in exactly the same way as we approach any other uh, sector. Uh, we will look at the case, we will look at the evidence, we will gather views, uh, we will look at what authorities we have, we'll look at the legal uh, landscape, we will evaluate the risks, uh, and we will come up with decisions and, uh, and judgments. That is our that, that's how we provide the right environment for that uh, activity. Um, but what we can't do is um, engage in direct support in that way. Thank you. Um, when uh, many of us either uh, attend international conferences or uh, travel abroad, we often hear that the CAA is a world-class regulator. 
And um, there's a question uh, around, uh, given that level of respect in the global community, are there any areas of expertise that you're keen to prioritize so that you maintain that level of profile? Um, well, uh, thank you. Um, I, you know, I was careful in my my words, and we are careful, is that as a CA, we don't go around saying, um, we are uh, a world-class regulator. That wouldn't, you know, that, that would just be so wrong because when you have, if you have that sort of perception of yourself that you're, uh, you're only one trip away from a serious fall, what we say is uh, we want to be seen by others as uh, as world-class, which is something, you know, um, I think uh, I think different. And if, as you reflect, Brian, others see us in that way, then you know that is a very good position to be in. But it will only will only maintain that position through a lot of um, hard work <clears throat> and effort. I think in terms of you know your question of well, um, what is it particularly about that? Well, at one level you could say well, you've got a very good safety re record, um, uh, so that's an important part of it. I think a second part is we are a world leading um, aerospace nation. Uh, it's easy to forget that sometimes, but you know uh, this audience in particular will know that. Um, I think, though, that um, uh, an important part also is uh, how we look forward. And one of the things which I'm, I've been struck with uh, over the last couple of months is uh, how much of the work we do on innovation is not just, you know, we're dealing with the day to day and then we'll wait to see what comes next through the, uh, the mailbox. What we're involved in is uh, getting out and looking at that future regulatory environment, uh, understanding it so that we can best enable the, uh, the rollout of new technologies. Again, careful territory we need to be in here. We're not um, sponsoring those technologies, but um, as that technology develops, the, an awareness of the regulatory environment and the, the requirements, I think, important part. So that innovation is uh, something which uh, people are pointing to. Uh, another one would be the customer experience, um, where uh, we simply know that this is world leading because that's what the data tells us. Um, in to after in particular passengers with um, accessibility needs. So that's you know a big important part of our reputation. I think the final one I would say is our, um, our, our outlook, our world outlook, our willingness to reach out um, to um, you know, come together with like-minded nations uh, to be a very international uh, regulator. Uh, perhaps never more important than the situation we're in at, at, the, uh, at the moment is to emphasize that point but uh, people want to engage with us and to make sure that we engage with them in the, uh, the best possible way. Yes, thanks. And just to pick up something there, which um, is couched in another question, and it's particularly around um, the innovation developments towards unmanned technology. And CAA gained, gained a great deal of uh, credit for creating the sandbox and demonstrating technologies so that you could give advice but I, I mean, how is that going to develop uh, in terms of the push and pull between the regulator and industry? So, um, I mean, there's a little bit of, uh, we, we will see, uh, difficult to be precise in this respect, but the environment that we are in is one where we all know that the pace of technological development is increasing extremely uh, rapidly. Uh, particularly, say, in remotely piloted uh, systems, I mean, this is where we are at the moment. I think the next um, uh, one is, well, how do we do deal with uh, artificial intelligence? Uh, you know, how do we get better insight into um, programming of, uh, of systems? Um, so that is good. Is that, that, that all of that activity is simply going to get? Uh, a greater part of our uh, job, and uh, there'll be more of it, more intense and working at a faster pace. So I can see that we're going to have to invest far more into that innovation uh, area. In terms of creating uh, the environment, what, you know, how do industry uh, play a part of that? Well, as you said, that uh, sandbox, then um, that already happens. And this is where that point about duality comes back in, is, you know, we, We've always known it's there, um, that need to ensure that you're still an independent regulator, able to independently uh, assess um, the uh, and certify systems um, with 
while still sort of uh, seeing the development. That, that, that thing we've always known is there. Um, I think we need to be much more explicit about it. And I think we need to be clearer in our organizational structure is who's doing what um, and who's there and who's doing what over there um, so that we don't have the risk of uh, potentially um, being captured by those technologies too early and, if you like, uh, trying to independently uh, regulate something which we've been a part of uh, developing. That's work for us to do, um, but uh, I think it's entirely possible to, to do that. It's vital that we do. The last thing that I want to do is end, end up in a situation where we don't have the knowledge uh, to understand what a future air system is doing. Uh, and if we don't understand it, how would we certify it? Um, which means you're either going to take risk or you're not going to certify it at all. Um, on the one side, you know, if you don't take the risk, then clearly um, that is good for safety. But on the other side is, um, well, what opportunities are going to, uh, going to pass you by? That's what we really need to, uh, to, uh, to get to grips with. But absolutely um, a big, um, expanding part of our, of our business. Um, this will be the last question. I apologize to uh, many whose questions are unanswered, uh, but time is of the essence. And switching again to a different part of your portfolio, and this time recreational flying, and particularly during the current lockdown, and um, the safety implications, um, fewer hours, recency, losing currency, um, is there any prospect of the CAA taking a more nuanced approach in these things? Uh, so, uh, you know, I mentioned it in my talk is that we have been looking at this very carefully and we have, um, you know, tried to provide alleviations and extensions and exemptions wherever possible. I mean, you know, we as anybody else know what the environment is, is like at, at the moment. Um, so, Yes, in principle, uh, we are looking at that, but clearly what you would uh, very much hope that we're doing is doing that in a carefully calibrated way and looking constantly at the evidence. Um, and if I look at recreational flying, um, there is, you know, the, the sample size is not huge at the moment, but there is evidence which suggests that uh, there are additional risks in some areas. And I think, you know, part of that might be to do with recency, I think a large part of it might just be, you know, we've got um, aircraft which haven't flown for a while and, you know, the consequences of that, whatever it is. But, um, you know, I don't want to make too much of this issue, but we look very closely at the evidence. And what we can't do is some sort of um, blanket, well, you know, we'll just go to, um, you know, a different approach for, for a while. Uh, we need to make sure that it is nuanced, it's balanced. Uh, it is based on the uh, evidence uh, and it is uh, proportional. To understand that picture, it's all about engagement um, and uh, I definitely would not want us in any way to be seen as, uh, you know, an organisation which is you know, somehow unknowing of what's going on out there. We know what's going on, we know the general environment. We want people to engage with us and say, well, here's a specific issue, a specific thing. Can you have a look at it? And uh, we will look at it. And we will show working, um, if you like, which will say, well, here's how we're coming up with the, the judgments that are. Well, thank you very much for that. And uh, as I said, there's a number of questions unanswered. There's a particular stream on uh, some of the complexities of ADSB, which you'll be relieved to know that uh, I've stored up. What we'll do is strip them out and we'll send them across to your officials so that they can uh, provide answers to what are very valid questions. Uh, yeah, but and my I'm thanks very much. Uh, I'm very happy. You know, please send those questions through. We'll look at it, and I'll get back to people. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, thank you to the audience provide, for providing such an array of questions. Um, the um, throughout all your remarks, both your um, your initial part and indeed in answering questions, it comes across that regulation is essentially a human endeavour, and uh, to that extent the degree to which uh, trust and respect on each side, both the regulator and the regulatee, um, is absolutely the fundamental bedrock. And we can all go back uh, in our own experience and see where that has broken down. And I think one of the points you made on the international stage 
applies equally domestically, and that is to be non-isolationist. And uh, the degree to which it's possible to engage, as indeed uh, the CIA has in the sandbox in these modern technologies, um, is hugely important both for progressing the um, march of technology as it goes into modern aircraft systems, but also uh, to create that sense of trust and um, the sense that the regulator really does understand. And all that against this backdrop where you have to have a constant concern about your responsibilities in terms of duality. So no, um, uh, no mean feat to pull that off, but uh, you've given us a very, very good insight into what is facing you. And we're very grateful for your honesty and in answering questions uh, so, uh, so fully. So we wish you the best of luck and uh, we look forward to our constant engagement with your organization and with you personally. So thank you for that. Uh, can I just then um, provide a small commercial for some upcoming events? And um, the 23rd of November, so that's next Monday, we've got an expert panel discussing the UK as a global space power. Highly germane to the announcements today from the Prime Minister and Secretary of State for Defence as to uh, an RAF Space Command, etc. And there's also a President's Conference next week, which is focused this year on digital technologies to enable the future of aerospace. And um, if you haven't had your eyes open to the extent to which model-based engineering is now becoming rapidly embedded in design, development and production, uh, it's worth having a look at that, particularly if you're a data scientist, because you'll be amazed how many openings there are now in data science in the aerospace business. And um, following that in early December, the last conference of the season is the Air Power Conference, uh, which has a stellar international staff, um, sorry, cast, and um, is covering uh, all the questions that are being asked right now as uh, nations start to think about how to configure their air power against the threats of the future, which are very different from the threats of the past. So if you um, want to know more about any of those, they're all on the website, but do uh, follow up on any interests that you have. For now though, thank you very much for attending. And the webinar will now close and it does so abruptly. So we'll just give you a stately wave and say good night. Good night.